I've already made videos covering some of the worst defenders of car clout culture, but here are 5 JDM cars that were not ruined by clout. The Mitsubishi Galant VR4, also known as the Evo Zero, the Galant VR4 isn't really known all that much, kind of for the same reason that the regular Mitsubishi Galant wasn't really that known. Most people assume this to be some unremarkable grandma car, and you know what? It is grandma's car, but she ain't the one needing help, she's the one dishing out the ass whooping because her car's got an all-wheel drive transmission made it to a 2 liter turbocharged inline 4 but wait there's more. The 7th and 8th generation Galant VR4s featured a twin turbocharged dual overhead cam V6 in order to keep the car uniquely distinct from the now iconic line of Lancer Evolutions that were being produced by Mitsubishi which is known for having a turbocharged inline 4. So this car unintentionally graduated and got an even sicker engine and became an even sicker sleeper and people still don't know about it. Insert comments of people saying, so it's like a baby GTR just because it has all wheel drive and a twin turbo V6. And you know what? You know what? I would probably think that it's a little better because it's not overrated and it's a lot more affordable. And in my opinion, just, just do me a favor and try to keep a lot of these cars in this video on the DL for your fellow car guys. Also, part of the reason that I'm using your guys' recommendations and tweets and comments is so if this video goes viral, I will not be the only one taking responsibility for an increase in price. We're all going to be at fault here when that happens. <laughs> I'm taking you guys down with me. We're all falling together. Together. The next car on this list is the Nissan 300ZX. The Datsun Zs may have been known because of Devil Z, and the 350 and 370s are known because they're great drift missiles. But the middle child is always forgotten about. This resulted in it being surprisingly affordable and, for the most part, not too clapped out, which is very impressive considering the wake of 90s JDM cloud culture right now. The Z32 300ZX was marketed as a more luxurious take on the sports coupe, which was a pretty popular trend during the 90s. While while many back then ridiculed its somewhat porky appearance, the modern era has done these lines justice. As we already know, thick hips save lives, and goddamn did its future successors get some curves. I tell you what, this is what we're talking about when it comes to peak automotive styling. Okay, so the 300ZX, right? The prices, they're not impossibly high. Perhaps the reason it didn't skyrocket is because it's living in the shadow of the skyline, but also because it had a fair production run with 39000 units reaching the United States, which is more than four times of what the entire world's production of the NSX. So I hope that gives a better frame of reference of how not rare this car is, so please just don't buy one of these and bubble wrap it with layers of wax and store it in some basement six stories underground, alright? I want people to drive these, I want people to take care of these, and also instead of making this another entry, I'm also going to add the Z31. If you don't care about modern amenities and maybe you want a lighter car, of the Z31 from the 80s can also be found extremely cheap, sometimes even at junkyards. I have a friend who has more than six of them, and he has bought each one for less than two grand. So that is an extraordinarily easy Japanese car to buy in this day and market still. I think Z chassis cars in general, they have all that 80s to 90s Japanese charm without the obscene clout boy prices or drift taxes. Moving on though, the Honda Del Sol. So the prices of these definitely went up, and you can still find some higher mileage examples that are around a few thousands. Crazy part is, even at 300,000 miles or beyond, their engine is still running, which is more than anyone can ask for when buying a car for $2,000 these days. Even if you do pay more, this is still a good car. I think the main reason these never got swept up with clout boy prices is because in the United States, small cars aren't popular, and parents of kids these days always keep telling their children to buy bigger cars to be safer from other big cars, which then causes the next generation to buy even bigger cars and blah 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 blah. Will future cars even fit in like a lane of traffic at the rate that we're going? Like in the next coming decade are we actually going to have to make lanes wider on top of the fact that we already keep paving more lanes? And you know what? I'm going to stop thinking about this before it sends me into another existential urbanism crisis. Anyways, the Del Sol is a two-seater car weighing only 2,200 or 2,500 pounds depending on generation. It's powered by a 1.5 liter or 1.6 liter inline four that's made it to either a four-speed auto or five-speed manual. With how stupidly high Miata prices are getting, the Del Sol can be a slightly more stylish option. Sure, it doesn't have the haha -ha funny headlights that go uppity down and can wink and blah 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 other 90s Miata stuff, but it weighs somewhat similar, has similar engine size, and it comes with a free paint matched Targa top instead of having to pay over 3 grand for the abomination that is Miata hardtop pricing, because for the literal price of a Miata hardtop, you can buy an entire Del Sol car that already has a paint matched hardtop. 
On the topic of Mazdas though, if you really want a nice lightweight Mazda for a far more affordable price, then for around two to six grand, you can buy yourself a nice Mazda Proto-J, and this one can actually carry the homies with you. These cars can be found relatively cheap, even with low mileage, and along with the Galant, it's probably one of the few cars that you can buy for around five grand these days and have them actually start and run. Honestly, it's more than what most people can ask for for a price like that, and wow is Gen Alpha screwed, because I know that like they're a few years away from driving age right but if gen z is literally paying like 10 times more than what the millennial generation did to buy our first car like millennials right we were able to buy like crown vix buick regals like buick lacrosses and like a whole bunch of other stupid cars for 500 dollars. and gen z out here is like yo if i can get a car for five grand and it runs i'm good and that that blows my mind because a, I feel a little sorry for them. B, I really, really feel sorry for whatever Gen Alpha is going to grow up into. And before someone makes the stupid comment of, that's just how inflation works. No, not this time. Inflation for my generation and prior for cars has only been 2 to 3% increase in car prices each year. Just 2 to 3%. Ever since Gen Z reached driving age, cars have done nothing but increase in price. Even normal, non-car enthusiast cars have only consistently gone up and up far higher than a 2 to 3 percent each year with some cars like the clout boy cars going 100 to 200 percent increase in prices so trust me that ain't your typical quote unquote it's just the economy it's just inflation and no chip shortage in the world can explain that either because again those are used cars those are cars that were already made and already had a chip in them so it literally is just internet clout culture that drove up most of the prices because of that, I've developed a lot more sympathy for people who were once 16 years old, who looked at a 30 grand card that they dreamt of buying out of college, only to have six years pass, graduate university, get a first job, and then realize, why is this car 150 grand now? That must be a horrible feeling. Anyways, for an honorable mention, before we unveil the final car in this video, let's just talk yet again about the Honda Accord V6 Coupe. I'm actually not scared to mention this car because somehow it has not gone up in price despite all the times I've mentioned it. Specifically the Coupe though, because A, it looks cool AF, and it's also cheaper than the sedan since non-car enthusiast commuters aren't really buying the Coupes, they buy the sedan. Also, the Coupe has a cooler NSX taillights as well as, you already know it bro, this ain't just any V6. This ain't your base model Accord sedan with an inline Four. This is the same V6 as the mother trucking NSX. Yeah, baby, that V6. High RPM, screaming eagle. Seriously, I do like this car. I don't think I would buy one anytime soon. I would probably buy like a newer Accord V6. Also cool, by the way. So I guess we could include those in this in this honorable mention. Newer Accord V6 coupes are also cool. It's it's one of those cars that's such a normal car that it goes full circle and becomes cool because non-car people s hear Accord and they will buy the sedan version. And then when you talk to them about the coupe, they go, well, that's stupid. I'd just get a sports car if I wanted a coupe. So it's kind of left it where this car isn't really known by them and isn't really known by car guys even, yet it just has an NSX engine. So there's a certain amount of humor to that. Anyways, we definitely saved the best for last. If you thought having the same engine as the legendary NSX, which is now marked up to a hundred grand or over, what if I told you that you can get the same engine from an even more expensive, even more ridiculously overpriced JDM legend? That's right, baby. You already know what I'm about to say. The soup, bruh. We're talking the same Toyota reliability, the same boatload of aftermarket potential, and all of that packaged into a sexy luxury coupe that still has sleek lines even to this day. That's right, we're talking 2JZ engine. And before someone says, actually, it's a different engine and they're not the same, they literally have the same engine block, the same internals. I've researched so many forums, so many different Wikipedia pages, so many officials, Toyota sources even, and the only difference I can find people mention that was noteworthy was their oil pan and how their intake, so their cold air intake tubing is attached. Which, let's be real, every Supra owner ever changes their cold air intake take and anyone who owns a J 2JZ ever is going to end up changing and take tuning it and blah 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 blah. Sure, you can buy the Supra 2JZ in a twin turbo model from factory, but guess what? There are so many aftermarket turbos that are just as reliable and far more powerful these days because of all of the decades of research we have tuning the Supra and the 2JZ. You, can, you will be fine buying an NA version of the 2JZ and then turboing it later if you really really want to. That is how ridiculously misunderstood this car is because that's just what I call Supra 
super fanboy cope when they try to say, actually, actually, it was worth spending 250 grand on my super still. It's, it's a different engine, I swear, bro. It's different, bro. It's not like, holy crap, I just realized how much percentage, I'm gonna put the percentage on screen, I'm too lazy to do the math right now, but that is how much more of a percentage markup people are paying for a very similar car. So the SC300 surprisingly can still be found regularly for around $5,000 or well under $10,000 if you're willing to spend a little bit more for a slightly cleaner model. And we're talking the whole car and engine. Some will have mileage, some will have scratches, but you got yourself one clean, clean Lexus that's powered by the very famous Japanese tuner legend that is the Toyota Jay-Z platform. There's a part of me laughing because when I researched this video and I found those forum posts, one of them specifically was from the year 2000 and there were people who were debating on buying a used Supra or a used SE300. And this was the source I drew some of the information from for how the engines were mostly identical. The forum, however, concluded that since the engines were identical, the Lexus was actually the better pick because it's a more luxury Toyota, therefore it's gonna hold more value compared to the Supra. Mind you, this forum post existed before a certain movie came out just a year later. One that maybe, just sort of maybe, contributed just a bit, you know, to the Supra's now generationally recognized fame. This is one of the funnier things about the internet, is that it immortalizes silly interactions like this. Can you believe how ev any one of those people, whatever they've grown up to be from 2000 to where they are now, if any of them could look back at what they posted on that forum and see what they wrote, can you imagine how much their heart must have sank <laughs> and how wrong they were for buying the SC expecting it to hold more value than the Super because it's the Lexus version of the Toyota Super essentially. Imagine if the movie featured a Lexus SC300. Something as little different as that would have changed the entire timeline of the reality that we live in, where that would have been the car that became 250 grand and Supras would have been like five to 10 grand. And it really does just come down to that. Like that's how much of a difference clout and recognition makes to something. And the SC300 is one of those cases. So is it the 2JZ that makes the Supra 200 grand or is it Fast and Furious that made the Supra 200 grand? Anyways, if you love automotive content, then make sure to subscribe, like, and probably only share this video with your closest car friends. Check out my shorts. Thanks for watching. See y'all next time. Blade Angel out.